Melbourne, Australia. Home to world-class restaurants, fashion, sporting events, and of course, home to the prestigious University of Melbourne, Australia's number one ranked university. And Trinity College Foundation Studies can get you there. In fact, Trinity's Foundation Studies program is the only pathway that offers you guaranteed entry into an undergraduate degree at the University of Melbourne. With over 30 years of experience and expertise in preparing international students for university success, Trinity College's teaching and curriculum is second to none. You'll study a mix of core subjects and elective subjects, and you will learn from teachers who are experts in their field. There's also plenty of well-being and academic support, which is so important when you're so far from home. An opportunity like this is one that will open up a lot of the world to you. We have a program here that will help you to get where you need to go, but in a really supported way. Your new home is absolutely beautiful. The Trinity campus is conveniently located right next door to the University of Melbourne. The city centre is really close too. If you come to Trinity, you'll really get to experience the best that Melbourne has to offer. The campus is like smack bang in the middle of the city. So like you can experience city life, you can experience all of the good food. It's such a caring environment. It's an environment where everyone's out to make friends, everyone's out to meet new people. So it's it's a very safe space and it's it was a very good year for me. You'll be able to choose from many accommodation options, including homestays and purpose-built student accommodation. No matter where you live, you'll always feel part of the tight-knit Trinity community, which includes an extensive alumni network of past students who live all over the world and who will always be willing to help you out even after you leave Trinity. Of course, you'll meet plenty of like-minded students at Trinity and will start university with plenty of friends. So really, Trinity College is the best option when it comes to your education, future job prospects, and the chance to live in an amazing city and meet amazing people. Trinity College is currently offering foundation studies online, so you can start studying in your home country. Then join us and the University of Melbourne as soon as Australia's borders open. So apply now for Trinity College, your pathway to the University of Melbourne. And a very good afternoon to everyone who's joined us for tonight's lecture. My name is Ben. I'm one of the managers at Trinity College uh, in the Foundation Studies program. Tonight, we have a fantastic live lecture, Trinity Talks, uh, lined up for you. Tonight, we're going to explore the area of chemistry and uh, particularly in an area uh, that one of our uh, leading academics is uh, currently uh, involved in research in and that uh, is looking at how chemistry can solve and help us uh, overcome the problems of food waste. We're going to uh, meet our academic very soon, Dr. Brendan. Before we do, let me uh, tell you a little about uh, Trinity College and the University of Melbourne. Trinity College run a world-class foundation studies program. The foundation studies program is an excellent way of preparing for entering uh, the University of Melbourne. In fact, it is the only guaranteed entry into the University of Melbourne. Trinity College Foundation Studies prepares students in a whole range of uh, different ways with critical thinking skills, academic writing skills, and generally the ability to do well at such an outstanding university. Trinity College located inside the campus of the University of Melbourne, which means students who come and join us at Trinity College are already part of Melbourne University right from day one. Trinity College, you'll see it on your screen there inside the campus of Melbourne University. The University of Melbourne, of course, is Australia's number one ranked university. We've been uh, ranked number one for well over 15 years now. And our current ranking puts us at 33 worldwide. 
this puts us in a, a very special and elite group of universities all around the world. But for me, this is the most important ranking of all. Okay, this is what we call the graduate outcomes ranking, which tells us how employable our graduates are when they uh, graduate from the University of Melbourne. Currently, Melbourne University graduates are ranked eighth worldwide on the QS graduate employability ranking. And after all, the reason why you're uh, coming to uh, or going to study at university is to get a good job so that you're competitive when you graduate. So the University of Melbourne and Trinity College, if you're uh, planning on studying somewhere uh, overseas when you graduate from high school, this is the one for you. So then, tonight, a fantastic uh, live lecture lined up for you. Um, before we uh, introduce our academic for tonight, um, a few rules. Um, I can see already we've got well over 500 students joining us, which is fantastic. I can see students from uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, from the Philippines, uh, from Cambodia and Thailand and China, uh, there's students uh, from Singapore, Malaysia there, further afield from Bangladesh, India. Wow, what an amazing collection of students and, and minds from all over the world. With so many students uh, joining us for tonight's lecture, we need a few rules to make sure that it runs smoothly. Of course, we want this to be as interactive as possible. Our academic, our lecturer, will have the chat box open. If you would like to comment on any of the content that is being discussed, put your comments or questions into the chat, not the Q&A, into the chat, okay? But please keep these chat, uh, the chats, keep your questions and comments relevant to the topic. Okay, the chat box is not for posting your, your Facebook link or, or saying hi or putting a, a smiley face emoji. We know you're there and we know that you're very excited. Okay, the chat box, put in your comments. They have to be relevant to the lecture and we'd love to hear from you. If you've got any other questions that are related to other things, such as applications, how to apply for Tr Trinity College, what the entry requirements might be, when the next start date is, or anything to do with Melbourne University. These are the type of questions that you'd put into the Q&A. Okay, and I'm going to introduce you now to one of the other managers at Trinity College. James Curley, are you there? Yes, Ben. Good afternoon and good afternoon, everyone. So, James, how should students use the Q&A? Q&A box is a great function to use. Um, Brendan, our academic for this evening, and Ben's about to introduce him, will not be monitoring the Q&A section. So there's no point in adding information there about tonight's uh, lecture, tonight's presentation. Instead, just use it for any general questions you might have about Trinity College, about the University of Melbourne, or indeed about life in Melbourne and living in Australia when you are studying, when you are planning to study here. So any of those kind of uh, queries or inquiries that you might have, by all means, put those in the Q&A section. I know a lot of you will be interested in scholarships, so I've got some prepared answers ready for them. Uh, but put that material into the Q&A. And as Ben says, anything to do with tonight's uh, presentation, the content that you're, you're viewing, save that for the chat box, particularly when you're answering questions that our academic staff member might throw out to you. Okay. Thank you very much, James. So that's very clear, isn't it? Any other questions related to other things, how to apply to Trinity College, Melbourne University, Melbourne, Q&A, the chat box. Now, guys, uh, if you want to say hi or hello or put a smiley face emoji, do it now, okay? And then that's enough of the hellos and highs. We know you're there. We know you're excited. We want your chats in the chat box to be relevant to tonight's topic. Thank you very much. All the Vietnamese students, very excited there. And uh, let's uh, move on to a couple of the other rules very quickly. 
Students, if you have not registered in your name on the website, that is, if you are using a link that was sent to you by your teacher, you won't get a certificate, okay? We need you to register on our website for these series of lectures. Go to our website. My colleague will put the link in now. If you are using a link that was sent to you by a teacher, if your name is under someone else's, go and register your real name, okay? Um, as I said, keep the chat in English. We wanna hear your comments, keep it relevant on the topic, okay? And also keep it respectful in English and respectful. If there are any comments that I don't think are suitable or appropriate, you'll get one warning and then you'll be, uh, and then you'll be uh, disconnected from the lecture. Okay, let's meet our academic for this evening, Dr. Brendan Holland, uh, Senior Academic uh, Lecturer in Chemistry. Dr. Brendan, are you there? Please join us. Hello. Hello, hey. Brendan. Ah, here I am. Excellent. Fantastic. Brendan, how are you? Wonderful, thank you. And yourself, Ben? Very good. I'm excited about this topic and so are all of the students. I'm going to hand over to you now um, and you can tell us all about how chemistry is going to solve uh, one of the big problems in the world with food wastage. Um, students, there will be a Q&A session, question and answer session at the end of tonight's lecture and I'll see you then. Over to you, Dr. Brendan. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. And it's wonderful to have everyone here tonight and excited to hear a little bit about chemistry and the chemistry of food waste. To commence tonight, I'm going to share my screen. So, yes, there we go. Hopefully you can see that nice and clearly. Okay. So that, as you know, you're here, we're here to talk about the chemistry of food waste. Second, we're gonna talk a little bit about the problem and the, the size of the problem of food waste. And we're going to talk a bit about how chemistry, just like Ben said, how chemistry can help solve these problems. But first, before we do any of that, let's have a little talk about who I am. So I studied a Bachelor of Science to get where I am, Bachelor of Science with Honours, and I completed that uh, when some of you were a lot younger, of course, than you are now. After my Bachelor of Science, I moved on and studied a PhD in analytical chemistry. Uh, during my bachelor, I majored in biotechnology and chemistry. I was interested in both subjects, but wasn't quite sure which way I would go. And then uh, after, after completing my third year in honours, I knew chemistry was for me. During my PhD, I had a look at this chemiluminescence reaction, which is chemiluminescence. If you're not quite sure what that is, it's a bit like bioluminescence. So fireflies, it's a reaction between two or more chemicals to produce light. And we can use that light in a very useful way because it helps us to work out how much of a substance is present and if a substance is present. So for example, I had a look at neurotransmitters. This is a picture of a rat's brain, a frozen rat's brain. And this is what I was looking at for neurotransmitters. Things that could tell us a little bit about maybe depression, a bit about uh, schizophrenia and other, other different conditions. And we use chemiluminescence to help learn about the neurotransmitters in these samples. Did a few other things, but that's the, that's the main points of my PhD. After finishing that, I have worked here at Trinity College as a lecturer and tutor in chemistry. And I also, as Ben mentioned, I'm also a researcher into looking at food waste and trying to reduce the environmental impact of it. 
So food waste is obviously quite a big problem. So how can we reduce it and uh, negate the environmental effect? So that's a bit about me. Now, let's talk about and think about food. I bet most of us or all of us love food and all the different situations, you know, we can have food as something to share with friends and family. Food as part of celebrations. Uh, we, we go out for special meals. We cook for ourselves. Food comes in many different many different cultures from many different countries and even animals like as the crocodiles in northern Australia love their food and with all this food unfortunately there is some waste so let's see I, I know everyone's uh, good at using the zoom chat I've seen a few uh, highs pop up but I want to ask you a question about food. Let me know, what is the last thing you ate? And a simple yes or no, did you eat it all? What is the last thing you ate and did you eat it all? Okay, I can see Shirley had fruits, Albert had chips, Yadana had bread and that was a yes. Uh, someone had wafer and that was a no. There's lots of, so Leanne had noodles and that was a yes. Everyone's, everyone's found the chat box. That's fantastic. Pork. Of course I ate it all, Letitia says. Wonderful tuna sandwich. And yes, that's good. So most people ate it all, which is fantastic. All right. I'm just going to put the chat away now. And while you're, while you're telling me the things that you've eaten, I just want to ask a question. You don't have to answer this. I don't want, want you to answer this one in the chat. I just want you to think about it. Is it bad manners to eat of all of your food? Because sometimes in some countries, if you go to someone's house and you eat all your food, it means they haven't given you enough. You must be unsatisfied. So it's bad manners. But then sometimes if you leave your food, in other situations, if you don't eat your, your food, people might say, oh, they didn't like that. Oh, this food must have been bad. Hmm. So is it bad manners to eat all of your food? As you can tell, or as, as we've just thought about it, there's quite a few, there's not really a yes or no answer to that, is there? All right. Now, another question while you've got that chat box nice and handy. How much, A, B, C, or D, how much of the food do you think in the whole world that we produce is wasted? How much food do you think is wasted? I can see lots of people saying D, some people are saying C. If you remember the, uh, if you remember the introduction for tonight's talk, the, the little description, that's where the answer was. D, C, B, ooh, lots of people guessing, lots of different answers, but most, oh, someone said more than that's on the screen. Interesting answer. I hope it's not more than on the screen. Okay, uh, man, yes, this is a place where you can answer as well as ask me questions that's right thank you all right hey yes lots of lots of different answers this is wonderful how much of the food we humans produce is wasted the answer here is d 33 percent of all the food that we produce in the world gets wasted 33 percent if we want to think about that in terms of hippopotamuses that is nearly one, one thousand million hippo, one billion, one thousand million, one billion hippopotamuses. Nearly one billion, one point three billion tons. That's an astronomical amount, and it makes us ask: Why is so much wasted? Why is so much of all this beautiful food 
we produce wasted? Lots of different reasons. Here is a picture of a lot of wasted strawberries. This was caused by essentially demand for strawberries. This was in Australia a couple of years ago. Demand for strawberries fell completely. So farmers had planted all these crops and before the strawberries could be harvested, no one was buying them. There was a bit of a scare with needles. What was happening is some people were putting needles into strawberries and then people would buy them and find a needle. Bad news got out about the needles. So everyone stopped buying strawberries and they had to be wasted. So this often happens. Something happens that the, the food can't even lose the use leave the farm sometimes. Sometimes the food gets wasted before it gets to us. It will go rotten, it will spoil in some way. Sometimes in their quest for the perfect looking tomato or the perfect looking strawberry, the perfect fruit or vegetable, all of the, what we would call the imperfect stuff gets thrown away and wasted. Now, I know lots of people are doing things around the world to uh, sell this imperfect fruit and vegetable at markets, but still, uh, there's a lot of that gets wasted. How about your fridge? Does your fridge look a bit like this after the COVID pandemic? You've bought, gone out to the shops, you've bought lots of food, and then you decided you didn't want to cook, so you've got lots of takeaway. And now your food fridge looks a bit like that. Hopefully not. Mine, mine isn't that bad. There might be one or two wasted things, but definitely not that bad. And of course, there's what we were just talking about. It was good to hear that you most people here ate the all of the last thing that they ate. There's lots of uh, there's lots of yeses in that in that. Uh, in the chat box. So that was fantastic. But there is still, uh, we don't always eat all of what we're served. You know, we might go to a restaurant and we've got a great big meal and we can't finish it all. So it's not just us that's the problem. There's multiple steps along that food production. That's the whole supply chain from grower to us. There's lots of opportunities and for waste to occur. So we're going to have a little bit of a look at how to stop this and what can we do with this, what we might call unavoidable waste. Sometimes this waste is a bit unavoidable, especially these first two pictures. Before we do that, we're going to have a bit of a look at some of the problems of food waste. Now, Australia is a very dry country and we are subject, we get lots of drought here. So when we produce food and waste it here and other parts of the world, it puts stress on our water supplies. If we don't have enough water to feed or for humans, for animals, for food production, you can imagine the sorts of problems that's going to create. So wasting water is a big problem. There's also the problem of land. You think about it, we need to clear rainforests, forests, animals' habitats. We need to make space to grow food. Yes, we've got lots of farmland already, but as the population of the world grows, we need more and more space. So we're taking away habitats of wild animals, which is a big problem. What about the financial cost? Look at that number. US, $1,000 billion per year of, is wasted in just food waste. That's how much money, that's astronomical. In that time that you're going to be talking or listening to me talk tonight, that's about $114 million worth of food waste. That's huge. Aside from that, there's also the biosecurity problems. With food waste, it gives a chance for diseases, 
harmful bacteria, microbes, and other not very nice things to grow. And that spreads to the good food. It might potentially spread to humans. And it's also spread and been a part of the problem for African swine fever. Now, I don't know if you've heard much about this particular disease, but it's, well, it's been a big problem. It's resulted in lots of pigs having to be culled all around the world, costing a lot of people a lot more money. And it's caught, been caused by feeding contaminated food waste to these pigs. So that's quite a big problem. So there's lots of environmental and financial problems. What about the other environmental problem of greenhouse emissions? Time to get that chat box out again and tell me how much do you think food waste contributes to the world's greenhouse gas emissions every year? Lockman, C, Harry, D, or a couple C and D, Min, has answered C, Catherine has answered B, C, D, A, there's answers for everything. Hmm. Lots of C's, lots of C's, A, B, all right, let's see. The answer actually, yeah, knee has just got that answer. It's B, 10% food waste. I'm going to close the chat now. Food waste contributes 10% to the global greenhouse gas emissions every year. So that's a significant contribution to climate change. And if we think about it, if we made all that food waste into a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. I'll leave you to guess which two countries are the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, but food waste would be third. So that's a significant effect. Above all those other environmental effects we were talking about, it's a significant effect, influence on greenhouse gas emissions. And how does that happen? Well, the chemistry of it is methane. This simple alkane here, CH4, the simplest of the alkanes, it is responsible, or it is emitted by food waste. And even though there's much less of that in the environment than carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas that we commonly associate with causing climate change, it's about 20 to 30 times more harmful in the environment than CO2, carbon dioxide. Some sources estimate it might even be 80 times more harmful. And because of that, it's responsible for at least a quarter of today's global warming effects. So methane is, that, is a big problem from a chemist's point of view. So if we can cut down the emissions of methane, we can make a huge effect on slowing climate change. But as chemists, we're also interested in all the nutrients. When we waste food, we waste a lot of good nutrition and nutritional value. We waste the vitamins. And the vitamins are important and the minerals are important to help us stay healthy and prevent disease. Carbohydrates are really an important energy source for us. Fats are important. Our bodies need them for a lot of different functions, nonetheless our cell membrane or the thing that uh, keeps our cells safe. But there's also the proteins and amino acids. So food is full of these wonderful things. And when we waste it, we're throwing it all away. So how can we use these nutrients? This is what we're interested in as chemists. What can we do with these? A lot of people or a few people are working on taking the nutrients and using them as chicken feed. 
all those nutrients that are important for us and our own health are also important for animals such as chickens and in a similar fashion fish feed there's also the ability to take those nutrients and that goodness to try and grow more plants and more crops so as liquid fertilizers we can compost food waste and return those nutrients back to the soil and we can also use it to make energy so there's a lot of ways rather than just throwing food waste into the bin and having it end up in landfill and contributing to all these greenhouse gases and all these other wasted resources there's a lot of different uses that we can get out of all this waste. So let's have a bit of a look at the feed and fertilizer, the first four of these for these uses. So if we can use food waste as a feed or a fertilizer rather than it ending up in landfill, that means that we can use other things like soybeans and chickpeas and other foods instead of using them to make the fetal fertilizer, we can use those resources for things like alternative fuels. Because we all know about the problem with traditional fossil fuels. You know, we can't replenish them and they're making a huge effect to or impact on climate change. But if we can make alternative biodiesel, environmentally friendly fuels, rather than using this to make animal feed, well, we're a lot better off all around. You know, we're taking all these lost nutrients so we can divert things that we already have into other uses. And of course, all this food that we don't have to use to make animal feed, we can use it to feed more people around the world. Um, we're not going to have that debate here tonight. But you, you can imagine how, you know, there's always hungry people in the world, so we could repurpose that. All right. So it will be great to convert food waste to feed or fertilizer. So how will we do it? There's lots of different ways that chemists and other scientists and engineers are all working together on to try and get food waste into an effective fetal fertilizer. There's a traditional cooking, dehydrating to remove water. We can do that by drying in the sun as well. We can use bacteria and other additives to accelerate the breaking down of food. And we can also use composting. So there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of tools at our disposal. And we're gonna talk about some of these and some others in the coming slides. But with all of these techniques, we've got quite a few things to consider. Firstly, we don't want to destroy the nutrients because the whole point of taking the food waste and giving it to the animals or as a fertilizer is for the nutritional value. There's also that problem of how do we store all this? Food waste is being generated every single day every single minute you saw how much per hour how do we take all that and and transport it process it handle it and use it where we need to when we need it there's that biosecurity risk that i told you about if we're not careful we can cause things like african swine flu okay so we can we can cause these microbiological nasties to spread through our food waste. There's a lot of water. So if we can trap some of that water and repurpose that, that would be fantastic. And we don't want the food waste to go bad or too bad. I mean, if it's a little bit bad, you know, we can handle that quite all right. But if it goes really bad, can you imagine working with a big tank full of food waste? that's been in the hot sun for a few days and gone smelly. 
yeah, no one wants that, do they? So these are our challenges. For making fertilizer, we don't have to be too, shall I say, concerned or too, it's not too technologically difficult because with liquid fertilizers, we're aiming to keep the nitrogen, potassium and calcium. They're the three key elements that we need. There's also lots of trace elements, so elements in small concentrations that are important for plant growth. But these are the three that we need to make sure we get. And it's fairly straightforward to, to do that because they come in all sorts of water-soluble nitrates and so forth, water-soluble forms that we can essentially mix the food waste with water, squeeze out the water, and fairly well get a nice, uh, a nice complete fertilizer. It's the other nutrients that are our problems. And in chemistry, this is, these are some of the things that we're really concerned with. The amino acids. There are 20 of these naturally occurring amino acids. Some of them are essential. And what that means is us as humans or mammals or other animals, we can't make these, okay? The essential amino acids, we must get them in our diet for our body to use them to make the proteins and do all sorts of functions that we need to do. So some of them are essential. So we must make sure that they are in our final product. The amino acids, some of them are really sensitive. So we need to be careful of how we're processing and treating the food waste to make sure that we're not degrading them. Here's three amino acids. Histidine, it's especially sensitive. Methionine and phenylalanine, all three of these are essential uh, for us, not for all animals, but for us. and uh, rather can be, especially histidine, quite sensitive. So what, what are the problems? What happens if we're not careful? With amino acids, if we're using high temperature and maybe even high pressure water, we can start from our amino acids, here's alanine and aspartic acid, and we can degrade them into things like ethanol, succinic acid, propionic, or propanoic acid, uh, common name propionic, not, not as easy to say. These byproducts are not necessarily harmful. So if we treat the food waste and the animals eat, well, it might not be, well, we probably won't harm them, but it means the nutrients are lost. So that's a big problem. That's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid degrading these into other things. We also want to avoid this effect of amino acid racemization. And that's essentially converting the L forms of amino acid. These are the ones that are necessary for us to use for all sorts of processes. We want to avoid converting them to the D versions. And the D versions occur in nature, but they're considered to be unnecessary. So we don't need them. So if we're not careful when we're treating the food waste and we convert all this useful L form into the D form, we've lost, we've lost a lot of the nutritional value. And you might think, aren't these two things just the same? Well, let me just stop the share for a moment. And I've got the help of two little chemical molecules here. These are not alanines, but this will help to show you what I, what I mean. So these are two different stereoisomers and they essentially look the same. There's one blue, one white, one red, and one purple. 
they are in fact mirror images of each other, like the D and the L of the alanine. And if I try and overlap these, you can see that the white and the blue will line up with each other, but the red and the purple are not. Just twist it around, you say, okay, I'll twist it around and make, make the red and the purple align. There we go. <laughs> red and the purple are now aligning. The blue and the white are not. Okay, so these are different shape. They interact differently in the body. And the problem with that is if we get the wrong version, things like our enzymes, our essential chemical reactions, they can't, they can't use it. It doesn't fit. It doesn't perfectly overlap. So it's not useful and it doesn't fit. Okay, let me go back to the slide. Here we go. Excellent. Now you might have learnt a bit about that before. the different uh, isomers. You might have learned about that before, um, but if you haven't, well, come and do chemistry next year and I'll tell you all about it. But essentially, it's a problem that we want to avoid. So that's the amino acids. What about the other nutrients? Well, the fats and the lipids, if we're not careful with them, the unsaturated ones, the ones that have a double bond in their structure, if they're exposed to too much oxygen or too much many harsh conditions, they'll undergo a peroxidation reaction. And there's a few steps that happen and we end up with this peroxide. And the peroxide is not necessarily bad for the animal but it gives the food a bad taste. So we want to avoid this peroxidation happening because it'll mean our animal doesn't want to eat it. This peroxidation, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but it's a bit like what happens when we've got some nice fresh olive oil or a vegetable oil or something, and it's been left out in the air. It's got old, something's happened and it's become rancid. And I don't know if you've tasted rancid oil. oil. It's not necessarily bad for us, but it's lost the nutritional value and it has a bad taste. So we want to avoid that. The other nutrient that we want to be careful is with the vitamins. And here we have vitamin C, commonly found or found in citrus fruits and others, ascorbic acid. And if we're not careful about that, it, we will destroy it by think, conditions like heat and UV light. And once again, the products aren't necessarily harmful. It's just they're not very good nutritionally. So we want to avoid that reaction occurring. Because some of these vitamins, they help prevent disease. And we need them. We need to eat them in our diets. Same with animals. All right. So these are some of the challenges that we work with chemists, as chemists, retaining all the nutrients. Now, what I want to do with you is talk about two solutions or two, two ways that we've taken this food waste and used it to make useful products while keeping the important nutrients intact. This is- Brendan. A, yes. Uh, can you share your screen, please? Let's oh, your did the screen please. stop? My apologies. The screen sharing must have stopped. Okay. Okay, hopefully that is working like it should be again. All right. Thank you, Ben. All right, so we talked about 
Okay, so in case you missed it, the lipid peroxidation, this is what I was talking about. We had that reaction of the lipids and we formed the lipid peroxide, bad taste, we want to avoid it. And vitamins, uh, we form these products that are not nutritionally very good. Okay, let's have a look at these solutions. Sorry, I forgot about the, oh, I missed the screen sharing problem. All righty. So converting food waste to feed or fertilizer. And you can look up more about this particular process on the website, foodrecycle.com. This is a company that has essentially set up, it's a bit like a factory, okay? So it's a bit like a big multi-step process where food waste comes to the facility, it gets weighed, it gets sorted, gets heat treated. Now the heat's got to be careful. You know, we don't want to, with the heat, we don't want to destroy the nutrients, but we need to kill the microbes. The food waste, we grind it up and mince it into smaller pieces. We do a liquid extraction and that's where the fertilizer comes out. And then they do a couple more steps and make that chicken feed pellets. Okay. So this is one way that we've come up with converting food waste to feed and fertilizer in this case, while retaining all those important nutrients. So cook, grind, we mix it with liquid to get the fertilizer and then we dry and grind once again. This particular process, for every one ton of food waste, we can generate nearly half, just over half a ton of water, 520 liters, about 90 liters of nutrient rich liquid fertilizer, and about 400 kilograms of poultry feed, 390 kilograms of poultry feed for every one ton of food waste. So you can see how how uh, useful this technique is for capturing all those lost resources in food waste. The other example I wanted to talk to you about is the Waste Master. And this is a, it's more like a gigantic oven in a way. It's, it's a unit, something that you can have at your own school, your own shopping center, apartment complex. So this is more something that gets put where the food waste is generated. And then every day, the food waste is loaded in. This, this machine blasts all that food waste with charged oxygen. There's a little bit of heat there, but mostly this process involves charged oxygen. And that helps break down the food waste really fast. And the importance or the advantage of these, this technique and the other one is that if we just put the food waste into a normal compost heap, it would take a long time to break down and it would still re release all those environmental, all the, NH, all the CH4, all that methane and other other products that are not good for the environment. These techniques accelerate that breaking down and we get something that's a bit like compost, but rather than having to wait months and months and months and having to store this everywhere, this can literally happen in the course of about 10 hours. And we get a nice nutrient rich residue at the end of it. Like I said, the, well, yeah, it looks a little bit like this, a little bit like ground up coffee, I suppose. This, this one here, this is a residue from some pastry and bread type products. So it's a different color, um, but the others are from lots of mixed different foods. And these particular uh, units are store or in use in all sorts of places like apartments, 
hospitals, mining sites, they've got them on ships as well. Because you think about cruise ships and they're out at ocean for a long time. They're generating lots of food waste. What do we do with it all? Well, hopefully not throw it overboard, but actually treat it with one of these machines and reduce the mass of it, make it easier to transport back to land. So how good are they? What can they do? Well, so far, these, the ones that are installed have saved 1.5, just over 1.5 million kilograms of food waste from landfill. Lots and lots of greenhouse gas emissions, equivalent to about 822 cars taken off the, the road. And this is quite a new technology. So the fact that such an impact is being made already is fantastic. So with these two examples, hopefully you can see how they can both actually work to solve the problem. We can have like a factory where we're generating lots of food waste. That's the food recycle to make the chicken feed and the fertilizer. That's the first example I talked about, where this particular example is really suited to being at the site. So we're in a hospital, in a shopping center, in those sorts of places where that are generating lots of food waste every day. I'm working actually with this particular way of breaking down that food waste. And what some of my work is concentrated on having a look at what is the value of that food waste. So it's already been proven that the nutritional content is remaining. We're not destroying the nutrients. But my work is associated on trying to look at lots of different food wastes and how we might blend them together in order to make nice animal feeds. So here's a table with lots of numbers. And what I really wanted to just point out was that for chicken feed, the national guidelines say we need about 15 to 23% protein. And if you have a look at all these different food wastes, we can see most of them are getting the right amount of protein. Some of them we might need to mix, like the grape waste and perhaps the biosolids, we might need to mix them up so we can get a nice average in that range. And the other thing I wanted to show you about the waste from the waste master or this particular solution is that, for example, the bakery with the uh, pastries and the bread, that's got a higher amount of fat and the mixed types of waste. So there's two types here and they have different levels of protein and different level of fat. The first one and the third one. And that's a bit of a challenge for us as chemists to try and track all this variation and control that for making something good out of the food waste. Anyway, there's a few numbers to think about. All right, so we've talked about lots of different nutrients. I want to quickly talk about some higher value products and components. Fruit and vegetables, olive oil, these particular foods contain phenolics. And phenolics are molecules that have many of these, what we call an aromatic ring with an OH. And they are really good for things like our brain health to help protect us against diabetes and cancer. So eating these sorts of foods, you know, we don't just say eat your vegetables for the fun of it. Eating these sorts of foods has lots of beneficial effects for us. And if we can take fruit and vegetable waste and take out the phenolics and make them nice and pure, then we can sell them as supplements or we can use them for human health as supplements. 
in order to provide us protection against some of these afflictions and to try and give us a better diet. Okay, so rather than wasting all of these goodness, we can actually look at using it as human health for, for humans. All right, we've talked about a lot, haven't we? And you might be thinking about, well, all right, what if we just be a lot more careful when we're producing food and avoid the rotting, avoid the waste, then we won't need to do any of this. Well, yes, you're right. We could cut down the need, but there's always going to be some unavoidable waste. And that's the things like the fish heads, the shells, the banana peels, now, I know a lot of people have got creative methods for using these things in their cooking and for adding flavor, but the reality is a lot of this stuff is wasted around the world every year. So that's what we want to try and, as chemists, look at capturing some of the goodness from this. One way of doing it, especially from fish, is we can take the fatty acids. So fish have lots of different fatty acids. We can take them out away from all that bone and scales, all that head material, and react it with other substances, like glycerol in this case, to form different fats, different triglycerides, which are very beneficial supplements uh, for our diet. Okay, Now, a lot of food contains these already, but the point of doing this is fish have very in very good, what we call omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, okay, omega fatty acids. These are really important for things like brain health. So if we can capture some of this value and use it, then that is uh, that would be fantastic as well. All right, that's using all the nutrients. The last thing I wanted to talk about for tonight was getting energy from food waste. All right. And here's an example of an apartment complex over in India. This particular village and group of apartments generates nearly 600 kilograms of food waste every day. And what they've done is they've installed a system that takes that food waste, takes the energy from that to power their lights, to power their gymnasiums, and to power a few other communal facilities in this particular town or village. And essentially what it looks like in a nutshell is the waste, the food waste is taken, it's converted in a fermenter and we get all the gases out all right and these are like the gases i was talking about bad for climate change but others we take them out and we use them for electricity generation and for thermal energy and of course we get the bonus of fertilizer liquid and solid fertilizer being produced so this is another alternative for using food waste. Not just animal feed, not just fertilizer, but for energy as well. All right. We've talked about lots of different ways of using food waste. And some of our challenges and considerations of chemists that we need to think about. So I hope this has been interesting and given you something to think about. This is the end of the talk part of tonight. So I'll now like to invite everyone, if you've got a question to answer it, and uh, perhaps even if you wanted to talk, I'm sure Ben could facilitate that. So thank you, everyone.
Dr. Brendan, uh, what a, a fascinating uh, lecture tonight and so topical and so important uh, when we're talking about uh, some of the big issues in the world at the moment and uh, more and more our, our country leaders are meeting together all around the world to talk about better ways of uh, protecting the planet, reducing greenhouse gases for the future. Um, so this is very relevant uh, for students who are maybe considering studies in uh, environmental studies, environmental engineering, or, or indeed pursuing this uh, in uh, the sciences and particularly in chemistry. Students, um, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your questions. If you do have a question, raise your hand and uh, we'll open your microphone and you can ask uh, your question directly to Dr. Brendan. Who would like, who's going to be brave enough to go first? Just raise your hand and I'll select you for the questions. Okay, so right from the start, we've got Tan and uh, then we'll go to Pradit, uh, Pradika. Um, Tan, go ahead uh, and ask your question. I've just enabled your microphone. Danvo, Tan, go ahead. Tan might be uh, having trouble with his microphone. I'll try one more time. Uh, allow to talk. Tan, go ahead. Maybe, oh, here, here no. we go. Oh, hello. Can you uh, hear me now? Uh, can, we can hear you. We go can. ahead, Tan. Oh, um, I just wanted to ask that. Do you think um, can, the energy from the amount, the amount of energy from food waste, do you think that that could ever be implemented into a system that makes our society self-sustainable just from that energy? Good question. And yeah, I, I could see that one there in the chat. So thanks for asking that one. I think the short answer would be no, uh, just using food waste you know, can we power our whole city or our whole society? But I think it's part of, it can really be part of that solution because we've got things like solar. So we could, if sunny parts of the world, we can put solar on our roofs. We've got things like wind power and, and things like hydropower. So there's a few different, we'll call them sustainable energy sources that are being used uh, to help power. So I think it's part of the puzzle in amongst solar panel, solar power and, and wind power and so forth. So I think all these things can work well together. Hmm, thanks for the question. Okay, uh, next, Brendan. We've got uh, Tai uh, Dang. Uh, I'm going to enable your microphone, Tai Dang. Go ahead and ask your question. Taidang, one more time. Nope. So uh, let's move on to the next question. We've got a question from uh, Tanbin Tale. Go ahead. I'll just uh, enable your talking. Go ahead. Hello. You're on. Hello. So I used to have an idea that. So I want to separate molecule of waste of food and I still wondering how to do that. And is there any technology that can do that? So separating some of the molecules from waste food, that, that's what you're talking about? Yes. Mm. Well, as, as chemists, we think about the solubility is one way we can think of that and some of those other considerations I talked about but if it's a molecule that will dissolve in water well then that makes our life quite easy because we can we can mix 
our food waste in with water. And we'll get things like, we'll get many things coming out together, but your substance of interest will as well. But sometimes we might need to use other things like ethanol or other types of organic solvents. And if the thing dissolves in something that's toxic, so if it's going to mix in with something that's toxic, obviously that creates quite a problem. Uh, so yeah, we need to need to have a look and think about the molecule itself, and then we can consider how we might get it out. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got uh, a question from Max Cavalera. Max, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just asking uh, if there is a course in the community that specifically teaches the handling of food waste like this. Thank you. Uh, Max, would you be able to uh, ask your question again? There's a bit of background noise there and, and slow down a little bit so that we can, we can get your question. Uh, pardon me, can you hear my voice now? All right, good afternoon, gentlemen. I just want to ask uh, if there is a course in Trinity that specifically teaches the handling of twists like we just talked. Thank you. Is it, oh, were you going to say something, Ben, or? Yeah, so uh, we, well, I'll, I'll hand over to you, uh, Brendan, but um, the question is, is there a course at Trinity College uh, where we focus on uh, this type of thing? Um, and this is for all students. The Trinity College program, uh, there are, um, a, a range of elective subjects from the sciences to the social sciences. Many of these subjects are taught at depth and they're very, very thorough. By choosing the right combination, Max, um, that can lead you to all areas of study at Melbourne University, including areas in the sciences where you could focus on exactly what we've been uh, focusing on tonight. Brendan, um, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the chemistry part of uh, the Trinity College program and where that can lead? Yeah, thanks, Ben and Max for that question. Yeah, so at, at Trinity, our chemistry course is, excuse me, is designed to give you a good solid background. So we'll talk about things like food waste, we'll talk about organic chemistry, we'll talk about some of the fundamentals, lots of different areas of chemistry that we'll touch on. But then as Ben uh, mentioned, it's when you go to Melbourne University and actually pick your course, then you can focus on environmental chemistry, food chemistry, or, you know, you can, you can really focus on some of these once you get to uh, Melbourne University. So at Trinity, we'll give you the tools talk about lots of chemistry topics and then you can specialize at university. Thank you, Brendan. And uh, many, many of the students from lots of different countries come and study uh, chemistry and end up studying in all kinds of interesting areas at the University of Melbourne. So many choices. Yeah. So many choices. Um, we've got a question here in the chat box from Chloe Aguila, um, who asks, um, I remember the discussion, Dr. Brendan, about the fish bones and, you know, how we can use them. And she suggests, what if we were to clean the bones and boil it to make it into fish bone broth? And this, uh, this is a, another way of uh, repurposing uh, those, uh, you know, the waste from fish bones. Excellent suggestion, Chloe. And it really shows how, how there's so many things that we can do. Uh, it's not just, you know, trying to take out the key, like I called them, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. It's not just about taking them out. You know, we can, we can do things like if we can boil them up effectively, we can make a nice fish bone broth. So... Yeah, I think it's, there's so many things we can do and perhaps the, the solution I talked about won't solve, you know, it will solve part of the problem and making a broth uh, won't solve all of the problem, but it will solve part of it. So 
it's multiple solutions, I think. So the one I talked about, the one you talk about, all of this, I think, can really work together. Mm -hmm. So every little bit does uh, help. Um, we'll take a couple more questions, guys. So if you did want to ask a question, put your hand up now. We'll choose a few more. We have uh, two tall. Um, go ahead. I, I've enabled your microphone. So I can see from some labs of the world, there are scientists that have successfully uh, grew meat in labs and not from killing alive animals. Is there any way that we can do the same with other food, but change the structure so the useless part or the part that we throw away after we finishing making the food? So but I have an example, just like the fish, we grow the meat, not the bone and the head, and we eat the meat, so there will be no waste. Mm, so you're talking about growing the lab, growing the food in a lab. So growing, you know, for example, a, a steak in the, in the lab or the fish meat in the lab and not, you know, so we don't have to grow the whole animal and have all of this waste. And I think, um, I think in short, like that's, that's a really useful way of doing things because, as you know, our population's growing and food production and food waste has all of these problems that we've talked about. So if there's other ways of trying to prevent the waste, like what you talk about, so we don't grow the useless parts, uh, I think that that would be great too. You know, obviously we're probably not quite at a commercial or, or a scale where we can feed the whole world yet, but... Uh, you know, the sky's the limit. Well, who knows? Uh, maybe uh, maybe this student will come to Melbourne University and revolutionise it, Dr. Brendan. Uh, we'll take a question uh, from Olivia Joanna San Sanusi. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll like to ask regarding methane. It was mentioned previously that methane is 20 to 30 times more harmful than carbon dioxide. Now, uh, I've heard that some scientists have created artificial photosynthesis to turn water and carbon dioxide to methane as a substitute for fossil fuel. Now, is this methane different and is it like safe for the environment and for us? Thank you. Okay, so using an artificial process, carbon dioxide and water to produce methane. I'm not familiar with that particular process, uh, but chemically that methane, that's CH4, would be the same. So those scientists, they would really need to consider their process, wouldn't they? They would need to consider that methane, where does it go? Is it released to the environment? Is it trapped and used as a fuel or some other source? So the short answer is, I don't know. That's something for us all to go away and look up. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it's, a, it's an important consideration, definitely. Uh, a couple more questions. Um, we've got lots of hands going up. It tells us, uh, Dr. Brendan, that these students are really uh, interested and passionate about this topic. Uh, Catherine Tan, uh, go ahead. I've enabled your microphone. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, I would like to ask, does meat waste has the same way of recycling as fruit and vegetable waste? Or, and does it have more nutrition than fruit and vegetable waste? Okay, so does meat waste have the same way of recycling and does it have more nutrition compared to fruit and vegetable? So meat waste is an excellent, source and and you know it yourself uh, meat is an excellent source of protein so it's an excellent source of what i call those essential amino acids the ones that us and animals can't make that we have to get in our in our diet so wasted meat can be treated the same way as uh, these methods i was talking about tonight composting is not very suitable uh, for meat waste because it attracts a lot of insects and, and you know, the African swine fever problem. 
but yes, we can treat it and we can harvest those nutrients. The things like the bones are a bit of a problem for us at the moment. Uh, you know, you think about bones, we, we need to work a bit more on ways to grind them all up and, and get the goodness out of the bones. But uh, in short, yes, a lot can come from meat and fruit and vegetable waste, definitely. Let's take a last question, uh, and it's from Saif Elanani. Uh, go ahead, Saif. Uh, good evening, sir. Hi. Uh, hi. Good evening. Um, I wanted to ask if using food waste as energy reduces our carbon footprint. Yeah, <clears throat> really good question. So as with all of these processes I've talked about tonight, they're no good if we're using lots of electricity or adding to the environmental problem. Now, the good news is the, the two examples I showed uh, actually either create environmental credits, which just means that they're, they're neutral or they're reducing the environmental impact of the food waste. Uh, but things like creating energy we need to uh, we uh, we need to be really um, thinking about well what would the alternative be even if we the alternative would be solar power it still takes a lot of resources to make solar panels if we're using things like coal and like burning coal and all of that well obviously that's a big environmental problem so the short answer is these methods of both making the fertilizer and that example I've shown about that uh, community in India, they, they are actually uh, proven or the analysis has been done on them to show that they are better for the environment than just letting food waste go to waste or using a traditional source of fuel. Uh, so yes, for those techniques, but I guess we need to be careful what we're doing. So we don't want to destroy the nutrients and we don't want to be worse for the environment than we already were. So good question. Well, students, thank you very much for some uh, fantastic questions. There are a load more questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we just have run out of time tonight. Um, however, if, if this area interests you, um, we'd love to see you at Trinity College and at the University of Melbourne. If you do have any questions about how to apply for Trinity College, um, uh, the application process, or if you indeed are interested in applying, please contact us on this uh, email address that my colleague James will put into the chat uh, right now, if you could, James. Um, I'll invite James back on to, um, to join us in farewelling our students. James, are you there? James? Yes, I am. Here I'm is. Just, he's he's I'm answering just questions and quickly grabbing uh, something for one of the students in the chat, but I'll be right with you. It's been very busy. Uh, wonderful. Um, let me see, where am I going? Here I am. Wonderful lecture presentation, Brendan. I managed to catch a bit of it. I was very busy in the Q&A. We had lots and lots of inquiries coming through. Uh, so it was, uh, I think, a very successful event. Uh, and we've had hundreds of students stay on even um, now. And I notice it's passed well past the hour. So well done for holding the crowd. So thank you very much, uh, students, for joining us for this Chemistry Trinity Talks um, next week. Our topic combines three science disciplines, combining chemistry, physics, and biology, where three of our leading academics lecturers at Trinity College will look at how do we perceive color? What are the, uh, what is the physics, the biology, and the chemistry of seeing color? And so that's going to be a really exciting one. And then, these academics are going to look at, well, what happens if we don't see colour? 
and there is they're going to examine a, a, a population of people who actually don't see color at all only in black and white join us for that one next week it's going to be fantastic um students please go on and register if you are using someone else's link so that you can get your uh, certificate at the end of the series. Hope to see you next week. Thank you once again, Dr. Brendan, for joining us. And uh, students, we look forward to seeing you for next week uh, when we uh, bring you a really exciting one, Chemistry, Biology and Physics of Perception of Colour. I'll see you then. Thank you very much and uh, bye for now. We look forward to seeing you. Thanks, everyone.